en una ciudad pequeña como es La Coruña, donde yo vengo. En el año 94 95, si querías ser DJ, realmente tenías pocas opciones. Los clubs no arriesgaban en contratarme porque mi estilo era muy flojo para el público del techno y tal vez muy repetitivo para otros locales más alternativos que venían del rock y del pop, con lo que era difícil sacarlos de allí. Así que si quería pinchar mi sonido, definitivamente tenía que crear una marca que me identificase y me diferenciase un poco del resto. Y quería que todo esto fuese en La Coruña. Primero fue abriendo un club en el año 97 con el nombre de House Café, luego fue el sello. Y aunque pasó por diferentes épocas de éxitos y fracasos, todo esto era lo que daba sentido a mi vida. Pero fue en Brooklyn, en Nueva York, a finales de los 90, cuando realmente House cambió mi vida. Conecté con un colectivo de DJs que muy pronto veréis. Ellos me enseñaron la parte seria del House, la parte más sensible y el respeto de la comunidad por este movimiento. Y gracias a estas personas y gracias a este movimiento, puedo sentir que La Coruña y Nueva York especialmente, también otras ciudades del mundo, pero Nueva York especialmente, estamos culturalmente más conectados y tal vez ahora, con esto del house, nos sentimos un poquito más cerca. a principios de los 90 cuando lo escuché por primera vez la, la música house y, y bueno artistas como Kevin Chandler o Lee Lewis o, o el más grande el, el Larry Herb y, y bueno en el año 96 fui a vivir a Nueva York y de repente pues había había unas macro discotecas impresionantes ¿no? como en el Palladium de Tan, el Twilo donde gente como Dani Tanaglia o Junior Vasquez pues estaban ahí pues toda la noche pinchando ¿no? se formaban unas fiestas increíbles después acabé interesándome más por el lado más deep, más underground y, y fue a través de, de la gente de Funky Soul Rebels como me metí de lleno en, en ese estilo de, de música ¿no? y bueno, estaban, ellos estaban locos por ir a pinchar a a España ¿no? y, y los de House Cafe Music también querían ir a pinchar a Nueva York, entonces fue, fue fácil ponerlos en contacto y, y de ahí pues surgieron pues muchas giras y muchas, pues muchas cosas que a algunos de ellos les acabó cambiando la vida, a lo mejor, todavía. This is the story of a musical spirit that forever surrounds us. No matter how long until the next time, I'll remember these nights dancing till dawn that have reached my soul. Thanks to Frankie Knuckles, a little Louis Vega, to David Mancuso, Seth and Ben, The Warehouse, Paradise Garage, Funky Soul Rebel, the original New York Underground. Because I, in the late 80s, after the late 80s, early 90s, um, were awesome. They were, they were beautiful here in New York City for house. And it was something I couldn't get over. I was like really in love with it. And, um, I felt a huge change. Um, some of it was for good, but most of it I, I felt got kind of negative. Uh, a lot of uh, what I felt, I felt we were trying to build in the late 80s, early 90s kind of got shuffled and, and messed up. Um, you know, I remember going out a lot and not hearing real house and uh, and that vibe. You know, uh, I, I just felt like. You know, especially with rave promoters, it was all about money and these big events and, you know, these, these like, over-the-top light shows, and, you know, and stuff and, and, you know, glow sticks. And, you know, it was just like, after a while, I was just like, wow, you know, this is not what this is about. I want to bring it more home. I, I want to I wanna show, especially, you know, you had a whole younger generation, a new generation that was going out that never really experienced what I experienced. So I wanted them to. And I felt like the only way of doing it was to be DIY, do it yourself, you know? And, you know, 
that's when I had the idea of like trying to get a collective of DJs that we share the same thoughts and the same feel for house and and, um, and throw parties. We just wanted to be simple, you know. We wanted to be about the music and again about the scene, and, uh, which I think was a lot of was forgotten for a while. Um, so I wanted to do FSR. You know, I thought about it, and actually that name didn't even come up right away. I just had the idea for the collective of having people come together and you know, start parties and doing it right. Um, there used to be this uh, hole in the wall place called House that sold tapes. Um, they, this is when four CDs or whatever. You would go buy mixtapes of like different DJs uh, from all over the world, not just New York, but just like all over the world. And um, <laughs> I went and I got a couple of tapes, and this, the, the, the owner of House was pushing on me this free cassette by this guy named Jim Pope. <laughs> and the name of this cassette was called Space Dust. And the only reason why I took it was because it had a picture of Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon in front. You know, I, and I was like, the hell's this guy, you know? But I was like, but well, I'll take it because it's cool because it's got Star Wars on it, right? And I love Star Wars. So, so I, but I remember hearing both side A and side B um, from beginning to end, and, and wow, this is great. And then um, I ended up going to Europe for a while on my own. Um, and I remember coming back, and I was like, right, I'm gonna do this, you know, I'm gonna find these DJs. And I remember I was DJing at this little crappy bar. And it was my, it was like my first little residential gig here in New York City, and I was DJing to probably like three people. There was no one in the bar. There was three people. One of the one of the people uh, was this guy with the most. He had greasy long hair and he was on crutches, and tells me that he was on a football scholarship from England here. So the guy turned out to be Nick Pat, and um, we started talking, and he brings up a friend that he's staying with named Jim Pope, who I previously got the tape from at the house store. So it was like, wow. And you know, we just ended up talking. Make a long story short, I ended up convincing Nick to give this a try and not to go home. And I basically sold him on dreams that we were gonna, you know, be these like, you know, like, we were just gonna throw these like crazy parties and have a great time and everything is gonna be all right and it's all about love house music and blah, blah, blah. And uh, he agreed to stay for a while. Um, and it's been well, over 20 years he's never left. So <laughs> that was the beginning of FSR. And, and eventually I met Jim Poe after, shortly after and um, he was part of the original F, uh, FSR crew. And, um, and then yeah, and then we got, uh, I put Steven Garcia in, who's my, and then uh, later on we had Gordon French, and then uh, Jacqueline DeSantis, and then uh, and then that was it. That was the crew for a while, um, the New York-based crew anyway. I remember this old documentary um, called Maestro um, and God rest the soul Frankie Knuckles at the end of the documentary and I'll never forget it but it's something that is so true because I don't care what genres of music you're showing me or what's the new fad or whatever it's always going to go back to basics it's always going to go back to house and it always happens so I think that the future is I mean you've got some incredible groups and some incredible uh, um, you know producers and DJs coming out right now that really understand that and um, they are the purveyors of fine house, and they're doing some great stuff. Um, and I think that as long as people like us are still alive and, and showing people what real house is, it's always going to continue. And it's yeah, it's going to get better. Um, what I know, well, my mom used to go to Loft, and she was a, a, she was definitely an original Loft head. Um, <laughs> so I grew up with that. I went to the Loft when I was a kid, at least four or five times. But my mom couldn't get babysitter. Um, she took me to Loft and I was admitted into the Loft because there was no alcohol served in the Loft. So you could have kids. And I remember seeing a couple of kids being running around in the Loft when I was a kid. Um, you know, I grew up with the Loft and, and you know, whenever you hear about the garage, which don't get me wrong, I'm not taking away from the garage at all and what Larry was doing there. But, you know, you have to understand that these are the disciples of, of 
David Mancuso. And David Mancuso had something so different. Um, and this goes with what I was saying to you earlier. It's not about the club. See, because the garage, a lot of people were just about the club. You know, you're talking about a lot of people who went out there, they didn't even know who Larry Levan was. It was the club, it was the experience. You're talking about David Mancuso, who didn't have a club. He had a loft, he was throwing rent parties, he couldn't afford his rent. And he was playing a whole different kind of music. You know, he was tired of like the typical Studio 54, the Nicky Siano stuff, the gallery stuff. He didn't want to do any of that. He wanted to do something very different. Um, and he did. And I really feel he is, in a lot of ways, the creator of House. Um, and any interview that you see, whether it's Larry Levan, Frankie Knuckles, Nicky Siano, any of these guys, they're all going to talk about David. They always talk about David Mancuso. And he's very important. And uh, the loft is very important. If it wasn't for the loft, we wouldn't have what we have today. In every aspect, not just musically, even as far as party throwing, uh, creating a scene, a community, you know, having that that sense of, of, of community within this music, uh, which solidifies it more as a, as a lifestyle, as a culture. You know, it's family. This is who we are. You know, and that's the thing about house music. House music is not for everybody. It's an acquired taste. You know, you either get it or you don't get it. It's not for everybody, you know? but that's the beauty about it, right? That's why it's underground, that's why we love it. See, I think romantically, I'd like to think that the 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 underground collectives. I mean, that's why we did it, you know, to to, to, to kind of to give, to give like the the realness and an underground and a, a purity to the scene that can kind of half, you know. Balance the the mainstream thing. I mean, it's all about balance, you know. There's always going to be that mainstream, trendy stuff, whatever people go for, you know. Um, I think that, um, and even these days, it's come full circle again, and, and it's blowing up in this way that, you know, people think they know what deep house is, and they, they, they call things deep house, and you know, I think that, that that's affected by the big names and the fact that that's blowing up. But I think that the underground will always be there, and it will always keep that, the, the, the purity, the realness alive, you know? Saying yes. And that's, the, that's part of the scene that's changed that, that is a little weird for me to adjust to because that's how I grew up with it, you know? I mean, like, before I could go to the clubs, I, I'd be in the record stores, like, listening to the new music and, and, and it's like everyone would be hanging out there all day, you know, just like, there was a, it was kind of the center of the, the daytime house community, it was like the record stores, you know? And also, obviously, how it would support the, the, the independent labels and stuff like that, I mean, I mean, these days, I guess the, uh, the digital era, with all the record stores closing and so on, it's like, I mean, I can see the, the positives for it and the pros for, for you know, cheap production of, of stuff without having to, like, press vinyl. Um, but I, de I definitely think there's, a, there's an element to the community that has uh, changed, and I, I miss it. I, d I don't know if you see, see how much of an impact. I mean, I think people have that, they hang out online, don't they? You know what I mean? But, I mean, I, I miss it. I miss, I miss, I miss like listening to the tune and, and, and racing to the booth to try and make sure you got that one, one of the, the three copies of the record store I had, you know. I'd say it started around late 1980s. I had just discovered the genre on the radio. They didn't play it during the day back then. You had to stay up really late at night. And I'd be there every time with my cassette tapes because I had my Walkman and my Walkman always needed new music. So, um, you know, keep in mind up to that point, I'd listen to pretty much everything. Else. Jazz, soul, funk, rock. I never limited my, my palette, but something about house music just reached out to me and like kind of grabbed me out of my seat. And I just fell in love with the music. I was always playing it. I was always blasting it. And it's hard for me to, to say intellectually why it's like there's there's no rhyme or reason to it but there's something primal about it that, that just attracts me uh to begin with but um it was definitely the social aspect of the music because it introduced me to people of the same sort of mentality and um that mentality was just the passion for the music for dancing and just having a good time. You know, a lot of us were, you know, not raised in the best circumstances. We're all looking for an escape. We're looking for a, a place to feel good. And house music created that kind of home for all of us. 
And, um, you know, Seth was one of the first people that I met that I made that connection with. And we were like brothers from the start. Like, we were just like, understood each other on that musical level and still do. And from there, you know, fast forward like five years, he hit up, started up the FSR, the Funky Soul Rebels Collective. And once that took off, I mean, I was on board. I couldn't DJ or anything. I, mean, I was basically the, the graphics guy. I was doing the flyers and the, the mixtape covers and all of that stuff, which I love doing, and I, you know, because I believed in what they were doing. Um, but I, I gotta say, their love of music and, and their passion for it was contagious. And before I knew it, I was hooked and I was buying records and I, I caught the bug. And before I knew it, I was playing with them and we were all, you know, the rebels together fighting musical mediocrity in the world for a better tomorrow or something like that. Well, the first time I really listened to a house record that caught my attention, I was listening to Gabriel Voltaire Colors, which um, it's a little bit techy, you know, but it's still very house. And I don't know, there was something about it. I was listening to a lot of industrial and I was listening to a lot of other stuff and there was something different and it just really kind of captiv captivated me. But then I also, um, you know, I used to go a lot to gay clubs to buy drugs and to, I was in a punk band, you know, so like the only place where you can get really hot girls and, you know, get good drugs was a gay club. Then we, I used to go to pick up the girls and do, do the drugs and they used to play house music. And, you know, I paid attention. It wasn't like, I didn't love it. It was good. You know, it was hot. But, but then I came to New York and um, the first person I met in New York, my first friend in New York actually was Joski from the Chocolate Factory. I met Joski and we were talking and... You know, around that week, he took me to a place he was spinning, and um, maybe it was a limelight, I don't remember. And uh, I saw the way ravers danced to house music, and it was on another level. Like, they, kept, they, they understood house music, but it, they understood house music differently. You know, it was like, it was more a spiritual experience than just dance. You know, it was like they were, they were praying, and that's what house music is for a lot of us. House music is a religion. It's, we pray. We, go, we don't go to church. We go to a club and we dance, you know? And music is a priest. The DJ is a priest, you know? Oh, well, well, hold on. Laurent Garnier, one of my favorite DJs of all times. Religious. Incredible. He gives himself to his music. Uh, I've worked I've worked a lot with Carl Craig and Juan Atkins, even though they're in a house. And they're techno, Detroit techno, and I find Detroit techno to be very close to house. Fantastic. I just did Terrence Parker not too long ago. And I thought he was, you know, he was house, and he was a beast. Uh, but uh, It's Everything was one of the most impressive DJ sets I've seen in a long time, actually. Incredible. And I've worked with a lot of people. I mean, I worked with Kerry Chandler, I worked with everybody. Little Louis Vega, I worked with, oh my god, Victor Calderon, Danny Tenaglia, everybody you say about that guy. Danny Tenaglia at Detour, on 90, uh, around uh, at the tunnel. I think it's 97 or something. 98. Wow. Wow. 6,000 people dancing to this music from everywhere. Church, I get. My name is Jeremiah. I am 65 years old and I'm an old school house head. Now, I've been into house music just about all my life. When it was disco, I discoed my ass off. And now that it's house, I house my ass off. But I have a family and a wife and daughter and we party party together. But it wasn't always that way. Um, as it turns out, we um, uh, had an apartment in Manhattan and uh, we went to what was then Virgin, Virgin Mega Store and we saw this album that was uh, uh, done by Pete Tong. It was uh, Pete Tong Essential Selections and that was the first year that he came to the United States to do an album. And uh, my daughter who was 13 at the time and uh, my wife and I, we, we listened to this album and on the album was this narrative about Ibiza. And I said, gee, you know what? We need to go to Ibiza. I was, uh, I was driving to work, I called my wife, it was close to my birthday. And she asked me, what do you want to do for your birthday? And that was one question. And, uh, and, and she said, yeah, I'll take you to Ibiza. And we went to Ibiza and we chased all of the great DJs. Uh, we, uh, Pete Tong, Carl Cox. Uh, we did interviews with Danny Rampling. Um, I, I, it, it, was, it was just a gas. And we uh, stayed with uh, uh, Danny Teneglia. Um, and we, we um, uh, uh, Jonathan. Morales. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, Morales. <laughs> David. David Morales, David, David, David. David. David Morales, and uh, and he actually uh, stayed with us um, 
uh, one night uh, we were partying um, uh, at El Divino and uh, and we shared um, a, a VIP uh, area together. But that was like the start of a, a family, as we know, and now. We're in love with the New York underground scene, DJs. Uh, and all the time that we were in Ibiza, we were going, why isn't this happening in New York? Why isn't it happening in America? But it was. And you know where it was happening? It was happening at Burning Man with the Burning Man people. So that that's our evolution. We finally, we stopped going to Ibiza because we found Burning Man. And we started finding the re regional community and, you know, the people right here in New York who have camps. They go every year. And we found, we found our lives again. We found each other again. I think house music can go anywhere because the one thing about music is that universal language that everybody can understand. There are no rules, there are no barriers, there are no borders. So it can go wherever it, it wants to go if, as long as people continue to love it. Well, in about 1985, 1986, I was already going clubbing, like clubs like Funhouse, Dance Interior, Studio 54, uh, just random other clubs. The scene was getting a little too negative, it was getting a little too hostile. You know, I seen the music going in a whole different direction. You know, I noticed in the early 80s with the, you know, transition of disco into early slash disco electronica. Like 85, 86, it changed my life because I had to get out of it. It was a totally negative scene with all the hip hop, the mugging, the killing. Things just weren't right, you know. You go out and get sized up in the club, you know, you have the freedom of dance, you have to look behind your back. You know, I went to a couple of house music clubs and uh, that was it. It changed my life. I noticed there was a lot of peace, harmony, love. Everybody was there for the music. Nobody was there to look fabulous or, uh, you know, oh, don't step on my sneakers, this, that, and the third. It was just getting away from the negative to a positive and it was just a beautiful vibe, the harmony. It was just, that changed my life. You know, I noticed that if I stayed where I was at any longer, I might not even be here talking to you guys. It was just going downhill for me, and I had to pull myself out of that. Just the, the big secret parties, you know, and, you know, it's parties like uh, Ego Trip, Roger Sanchez, there was Home Base with Bobby Condors, uh, you know, we have Club Shelter, which was another staple for house music parties. You know, you had like Soulful House, Deep House, you had Techno House. I remember Frankie Bones playing there at a party called Quicks in 1989, which was Summer of Love. I think that was a very transitional point in time for myself and not just myself, a lot of people. You know, as DJs, producers, dancers. Then, you know, there was a, a merge, a big fusion with all these styles of music coming together, like techno, house, hip hop, breakbeat. Everything was just fusing. So I was going to, into a whole different direction from like 1980 when I first started hearing disco music on the radio and when I first started going clubbing in like 1981, 82. I was going clubbing at a really young age, so I got exposed to a lot of different music. You know, it's definitely diversified my style up to date as we speak now. So many, so many different times and so many different ways. I think the first time though must have been in Chicago. I lived in Chicago, and every Friday my friends and I went to this hookah lounge. We love you, DJ. It was free. One of our friends was DJ, and Chicago was very well known for its house music. So it was very uplifting. Something I look forward to every week, and um, I love to dance. I would remix songs in my head while they were being played and make up dance moves with my friends and that definitely changed my life. Future house music. Um, good question. 
I mean, honestly, I, th I see house music as like a oh, like a blank a blank slate, and you could put pop music on it. You could put hip hop on house music. You could put um, you know polka on house music, and I think house music is going to start going into different genres and start influencing other genres of, of music that are already in popular culture. And, uh, I don't know. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, so. For me, dance music changed my life because as a professional, it gave me the chance to collaborate with some of the great DJs, especially here in New York City. And it gave me the opportunity to do mixes for high-level uh, artists, Christina Aguilera, Whitney Houston, Patti LaBelle, um, and, and Beyonce, Lady Gaga, and stuff goes on. So for me, what that did was open my relationships with these labels and other artists, and, and that way it changed my life in a big way. I was big into hip hop in the 90s and that's what I listened to. And I remember the, the first time a friend of mine was like, come on, you're gonna go to this party, it's called NASA. I was like, all right, whatever. You know, I, I went and I uh, was like expecting, I don't know what I was expecting, but I know I walked into this place and I saw people that I've never seen before and all kinds of music I've never heard before and just the, the bright colors and, and the, the candy and everything else that was going on back then. It was just an amazing, an amazing like, immediately changed my life when when I was in this party. I'm just looking around. At first I was like, wow, these people are crazy. But then all of a sudden I was just like, you know, I feel at home here. It was like back in the back in the 90s when this was going on, it was platform shoes and, and uh, club kids were all over the place and just different kinds of ravers and all sorts of interesting people that, that were really, uh, really different from the mainstream and it really made a difference in my life. Uh, the Fisher Spooner's number one album was a huge, huge moment for me musically. Uh, and then I found myself in New York a few years later when I moved here at 17, um, you know, working with a lot of the people that I, you know, followed online and wanted to, wanted to basically be. Um, I, I was working with them, and it was a few, few more years after that before I started DJ. But um, that really just kind of inspired me to move to New York and do what I do now. Philadelphia always seems to get lost because it's always look people always look to New York, Detroit and Chicago. However, what people don't realize is that through disco, which has its roots of beginning in Philadelphia, the 4-4 kick drum of the live drummer really defined disco music. Disco was always live musicians, house music took disco music into electronic field. Uh, substituting the drummer for a drum machine. So if it wasn't for Philadelphia, soul Philadelphia, disco, uh, I don't think uh, electronic music would be as affluent as it is now because of the 4-4 kick drum and disco and its start and its origins in Philadelphia. And then it just branched off to New York, Chicago, Detroit. To the edge of the earth I'll go to rescue you, you You're the only one I ever wanna love, love, love. Your love is like Um you know, DJing and what I do in terms of, instead of performing live as an artist, I DJ, it's a really unique way of being spontaneous with my creativity. So I, I never really know what I'm going to play or I have an idea. I mean, I like to educate people by playing new music and new music for myself, I mean, new music from home and recordings, new music from others. But at the same time, I don't want to be like a snob about this and only play new music that people don't know. That I think a lot of people forget with being a, a DJ is that you're still a performer and the symbiosis, the connection in between performance and education uh, and being able to rock the house and being able to educate is a fine line. 
So I'm very spontaneous with my flow and my creativity when I DJ. Um, like tonight, for example, and you know, uh, tonight is a house kind of uh, known club, the House Cafe and Move with Eno. And but I know this region is a little bit more harder with people liking techno. So if they know me, if they're coming out for me, they know I kind of mix it up in between house and techno, and I hope they have the patience for this. But uh, Unknown Area is just my, uh, my history of, of doing what I've been doing for over 20 years, and I can adapt, I can improvise, and that's the beauty of it. I prefer an intimate setting. That's what I like the most, where I can really kind of tell a story, like I'm reading a book to people because people can come up and say hello to me, they can ask what I'm playing, I can help sell records. Uh, it's more personal, it's like having the people in my house. You know, I said, you know, most of the guests that you have are more house. And he said, yeah, well, you know, I started with house and I love house music and Yes, a lot of house people come and play the club, but it's a mixture. Yeah. I said, well, usually up in this area, I imagine that it's pretty hard techno, like when I play in Oviedo yeah. or something like this. Yeah, really it hard. tends to be a little bit more tough, yeah. Yeah. and that's fine. I like being able to take people on a journey, but I said, the people who always make the most noise and want it the most loud are the techno people. The house people, they don't mind if you go to techno and if you go yeah, to a house. Mind. They wait, they're patient. Yeah. But the techno people are always oh. very... Uh, they want more and more. They don't have much patience. Air Canada 058 Heavy, descend 4000. Descend 4000, Air Canada 058. Count 557 Vancouver, Ravel, runway 26 right, Ultimate 13961. 4000, check 4000, check. Do you need to speed it easier for Canada 557? How important is Vancouver in the underground scene? Well, to me, very important. I uh, came from the east coast of Canada, ended up after university in Vancouver, and uh, ran into some like-minded individuals. But there wasn't really the uh, hotbed of nightclub activity like you might have in some other North American cities. It's not to say that there wasn't events going on and parties and all stuff, but it was more kind of like raves, warehouse parties, after hours, and stuff like that. But the one thing I definitely noticed right from the get with Vancouver is it was just a really open-minded kind of uh, mixture of people. You had all sorts from, you know, real music lovers, the hippies, uh, the downtown club kids, all sorts. And there was a sort of uh, a sense of that you could do anything uh, and that the city had a lot to offer. And uh, so for me, uh, I would say also with the sound, nature is a really big part of Vancouver. You've got the mountains, you've got the sea. So it's kind of a laid-back vibe in terms of the sound, but that also there's a lot of room for people to explore different ideas in terms of production. Um, and it's no slight on any other big city. Um, but I think also more on the East Coast, things to be tend to be there's a bit more history with some of the cities and their their music scene as it relates to dance music. So that uh, we don't necessarily have that super long history in Vancouver, and in a way that is a blessing there too, because you're not really bound by any conventions. You can just kind of you know, try things, see if they work, they don't work, and I'm talking about everything from club nights to production to, uh, you know, festivals, whatever else. Now, you know, uh, it's hard to believe that uh, there's, it's very advanced, there's tons of clubs, tons of festivals, events going on, so it's, uh, you it grew up pretty quick, um, but it, it definitely has a place to play and uh, it has a unique sound. House music para mí, además de ser la mejor música que pueda dar en el mundo, además de eso es lo que me hace levantar de la cama todos los días muy contento, feliz, consciente de que va a ser un día perfecto, porque no porque tengo que hacer mis responsabilidades, tengo que ir a trabajar, tengo que hacer algo, no sé qué, porque sé que cuando llego a casa de noche puedo poner unos disquitos, puedo buscar una música nueva y eso en mi mente funciona de una forma de que es lo que me mantiene vivo y activo y feliz entonces me doy una dosis de house music y tengo un remedio sí. es eso, sí. house 
The first electronic music record uh, I ever heard was uh, Kraftwerk's uh, Man Machine album. It was in 1977. And I was really amazed by these new sounds generated by synthesizers and drum machines, and these robotic voices and everything. It was uh, music from another planet for me. First house record which really impressed me was uh, first Matthew Herbert's album on Fauna Records. Sometimes I, I'm still listening to it because it's a uh, it's great example of uh, production and uh, of this synthesis of groove. And I always felt that um, this prominent groove, which always there in electronic and house music, generally, it, it, it's, uh, it creates a specific uh, electricity, a flow in human body, which gives you um, unique uh, feeling about true uh, um, unknown state of life, which we usually lose during our everyday life. changing it was like when the f when the photography came up everyone said there will be no painters anymore but there's still painters there's still photography so when the CD came up everyone said the vinyl will die the vinyl is still there now everyone is saying the CD will die because like there's like mp3s and mm -hmm. like buff digital you know yeah. music I think it will all exist like on their own Ricordo nella mia adolescenza quando per la prima volta mi avvicinai alla house music capì subito che era davvero qualcosa di spirituale, un, un linguaggio universale che poteva davvero essere capito e ascoltato da tutti. Credo che la house music abbia davvero la, la forza e il potere di, di unire le persone, di connettere le persone insieme. Penso che sia davvero qualcosa di speciale, qualcosa di sincero che viene dal cuore.
Il suono e la musica ci hanno sempre accompagnato durante tutto il percorso della nostra vita e sempre ci accompagneranno. Penso che la musica sia qualcosa di veramente speciale, di forte, che è in grado di eh, rompere ogni barriera spazio-tempo e che ti dà anche quella possibilità di esplorare quella parte un po' nascosta del proprio io. Aos meses mudou a minha vida completamente há muitos anos e continua a ser. Eu já tinha uma forte ligação ao disco, ao ligado a outras músicas de dança, sempre gostei muito curto, de festas, etc. E depois as coisas precipitaram-se, a partir do momento em que a Aos Music apareceu, abriu uma série de clubes que trabalharam com esse tipo de música, que foram pioneiros em Portugal e hoje a Porto cresceu, expandiu-se, etc. E de facto, o Norte, durante estes anos todos, tem sido um dos centros, há dois, Lisboa e Porto, um centro muito importante de, de atividade, com muitos, muitos eventos, muitas festas e muitos artistas convidados, tanto portugueses como estrangeiros. Mas o Porto sempre foi muito, muito, muito forte, com muitíssimos clubes, muitos convidados estrangeiros a vir aqui todos os fins de semana, há muitos anos, há mais de 20 anos. Quando comecei a tocar como DJ, a música na altura aqui em Portugal era maioritariamente rock, pop. Havia uns clubes que tinham, tocavam dance music, mas era o disco que chegava dos Estados Unidos. E eu comecei, de certa forma, a interessar-me por, por, por esse género de música uh, nos anos 80 e, e depois começou a aparecer realmente o, o Acid House e o House Music. Uh, foi, foi, foi natural, como mais tarde apareceu o New Beat de, de, e, e o Techno uh, e foi bom porque era difícil para, para, para mim e para todos os meus colegas em Portugal podermos tocar esse, esse género de música e eu sempre tive, eu sempre quis tocar coisas diferentes e, e nos meus sets e tinha uma altura da noite onde tocava sempre as coisas novas e a cultura aqui era muito de, da música rock e então chamavam-me o louco e, e então foi uma época muito engraçada até aos anos, o início dos anos 90 onde as coisas mudaram completamente e aí a música, as pessoas abriram-se para realmente receberem toda essa música que aparecia nessa altura houve uma ajuda muito grande também de, de outros componentes que, que fizeram com que as pessoas abrissem a mente e foi muito engraçado, foi o boom em Portugal da música de dança, foi no, no início dos anos 90, eu na altura tocava no Kremlin, em Lisboa, e foi a revolução de, de, da noite em, em Portugal, e então tenho boas, boas recordações desse tempo. Uh, como sempre trabalhei com, com, com música, sempre fui DJ desde os meus 15 anos, nunca fiz outra coisa. A música para mim sempre foi, digamos, a minha vitamina uh, da vida, para, foi sempre o meu, uh, a força maior uh, da razão de eu tocar e de hoje ser, e de ser DJ. Uh, nada foi programado, foi, foi tudo muito uh, natural, as coisas foram acontecendo e, e pronto, e hoje cá estamos, passado 33 anos, a, a continuar a fazer festas, a produzir e, e a trabalhar na, na indústria que, 
para mim é das melhores indústrias de, de sempre. Vale, pues todo esto de la música house, uh, yo lo recuerdo, eh, para mí, para, para mí el inicio fue más o menos, yo me altura del año 86, 87. En aquel tiempo muchos de nosotros grabábamos cintas de la radio, eh, pues donde los DJs, eh, recuerdo que el programa se Mix Favoritos, eh, emitían desde Radio Callao en Madrid, y cogíamos el dial a duras penas, y, y recuerdo que grabábamos las canciones, y, eh, o sea, las, las sesiones y, y a veces eh, ellos mezclaban de todo, desde Rick Asley con Bobby Brown, James Brown, de todo, todo junto, todo lo que tuviera beat. Pero yo, notamos que en el año 86, 87 más o menos se empezó a, a, a incluir una serie de temas que eran como más cíclicos, no con la típica estructura de un tema normal con estribillo, estrofa y demás, desarrollo, y era como más lupeado. Ahora es algo normal, pero en aquel momento pues, era algo nuevo, ¿no? Y, y no sabíamos qué, qué, qué canciones eran, pero notábamos que había algo y que algo estaba pasando, algo estaba cambiando, porque ellos empezaban a incluir este tipo de, de, de temas. Recuerdo, por ejemplo, así, los primeros que recuerdo, pues, eh, J.M. Seal con Jack Your Body, um, Mars con Pop of the Valium, eh, por ejemplo, Race, Jack the Group, es, quizás es, fuera uno de los temas un poquito más underground, pero digamos que esos temas fueron los primeros que llegaron a la radio y fueron los que, pues, seguramente que habría muchísimos temas más que luego ya fuimos descubriendo poco a poco, pero los primeros contactos fueron esos, fueron, para mí fueron, pues eso, eh, J.M. Silk, eh, luego más tarde también, eh, pues gente como eh, es J.M. Silk, eh, Nitro Deluxe también, con Brutal House, que era un tema más que era, para mí es como el puente entre las dos cosas, entre el electro y el house. Este es el disco de Rage. Um, este es el Max de Inner City, por ejemplo, que ya empezaron a combinar mucho más vocales. Y luego recuerdo, sobre todo, temas como House Nation, eh, que ya estaban mucho más presentes en CDs y demás. Y el Royal House, Marshall Jefferson con Move Your Body. Eh, y sobre todo el Lil Louis, también recuerdo que el vídeo además era como muy, muy psicodélico y era, un, era un, básicamente un patrón rítmico todo el rato, todo el rato, todo el rato igual, pero sin embargo la canción estaba en los 40 principales, por ejemplo. Entonces para mí eso fue como el, el comienzo de todo esto y de, de, de cómo se empezó a desarrollar. Básicamente eran música hecha con máquinas y, y, y ese fue, fue, fue mi, primer, mi primer contacto con la música. Yo empecé a comprar vinilos con 13 o 14 años y compraba de todo. Yo compraba trance, compraba progressive, compraba house, compraba techno, compraba... Pero cuando, cuando cambió todo fue cuando compré el, el Can You Feel It. Cuando escuché el bajo de Can You Feel It me cambió. Me cambió totalmente. Es que el bajo para mí, el, para mí el amor al house empezó con el Can You Feel It, sobre todo por el bajo. O sea, escuchar esos ocho bombos que empiezan y ya la siguiente frase, ese bajo, fue el que me, el que me, el que me liquidó. Yo creo que Madrid representa un papel bastante importante en el house internacional. Y aquí hay muchos productores defendiendo el underground house desde hace más de dos décadas muy intensamente. Y creo que contamos con una escena bastante sólida y no siempre lo mejor es lo más famoso al revés nosotros defendemos todo lo que eh, para mí el house fue la música que cambió mi vida a nivel de no solamente como disjockey sino también como persona y fue allá por el año 88 en un viaje que hice a Ibiza y desde luego el disco que cambió mi vida fue eh, tema que le escuché a Alfredo, que se llamaba Town Table Orchestra y la canción Gonna Miss Me. Eh, eso fue lo que cambió mi vida y lo que cambió mi manera de pensar respecto a la música. Al día siguiente me fui a Delta Discos a comprar ese vídeo.
House significa muchas cosas, es el, el giro lógico que viene después del disco, significa baile, significa creación, significa ritmo, significa vida. Le he dedicado muchos años a, a este estilo y pues también me ha dado muchas cosas a cambio, ¿no? como pues, un trabajo, mucha ilusión. Y bueno, si tengo que destacar algo, yo creo que el, que el primer momento que, que escuché esta máquina la Roland TV303 pues fue algo que me marcó muchísimo, ¿no? yo era un niño y la primera vez que, que la escuché yo creo recordar que fue en el disco Acid Over de, de Tyree en el año 88 y me quedé totalmente fascinado ¿no? de, por aquellas burbujas que salían de, de aquel disco y que, que necesitaba saber cómo estaban hechas y con qué estaban hechas y bueno al final pues con el, al cabo de los años conseguí comprar una y a día de hoy sigo, sigo utilizándola en el estudio. Para mí es la capital del house, de alguna manera la influencia que ha tenido Ibiza en, en la música de baile, en la música electrónica, es, es muy importante. Yo creo que de alguna manera se cocinaban y pasaban cosas en, en muchos lugares del mundo, pero Ibiza era un poco el nexo, de, el punto de unión y de fusión de todas estas corrientes ¿no? que pasaban eh, en todo el planeta. ¿no? El hecho de vivir en Ibiza también te proporcionaba la, la oportunidad de escuchar mucho house music. ¿no? Una adolescencia con mucha curiosidad también por las tendencias y sobre todo estar trabajando pues, más de 10 años en Discos Delta, que era la tienda de música por excelencia aquí en Ibiza. El estar en contacto también con, con productores y con gente de todo el mundo, eh, la radio, eh, es un poco lo que te va moldeando ¿no? y, y lo que hace que House Music sea, sin duda, pues, al menos para mí, sea un modo de vida. ¿no? ¿Cuándo? Cuando, mira, yo creo que lo tengo claro, fue a finales de los años 90, en la isla donde nací, en Ibiza, donde resido y donde trabajo. Allí creo que fue donde realmente tuve el primer contacto con el house music. Eh, hacemos una serie de fiestas ya en aquel entorno ilegales, ¿no? Allí yo creo que fue donde realmente uno se siente realmente invadido, ¿no? Por esos ritmos y esos sonidos. ¿Y cómo? Inevitablemente, poco tiempo después de vivir esa época tan buena en Ibiza que tuvimos de fiestas fuera de discotecas, me eh, salí a nivel profesional montando dos series discográficos y produciendo mucha música por el planeta, compaginándolo a la vez con la vida de Cabina y de Jockeys, dando la vuelta al mundo entero. La música house para nosotros ha sido una forma de vida. Eh, desde que comenzábamos simplemente divirtiéndonos a la hora de pinchar, de escuchar la música, hasta convertir la música house en nuestra forma de vida, en nuestro trabajo, ha sido todo un proceso, un proceso en el que pensábamos, en que nos sentíamos únicos, en pequeñas comunidades, disfrutando de ese momentazo de la música house, y nos dábamos cuenta que había otros locos en otras pequeñas comunidades que tenían el mismo feeling que nosotros. Cada uno a su manera descubrió la música house, y cada uno a su manera la hizo eh, propia, la supo expresar, algunos produciendo, otros pinchando y otros montando como nosotros medios de comunicación y apostando por apoyar cada, cada uno de los, de los pequeños movimientos que sucedían en nuestro país y fuera de nuestro país. Como programador del Festival Monegros, bueno, de otros clubs que he programado y, y, y bueno, por mi trabajo que siempre me he fijado mucho ¿no? en las programaciones de los clubs, no, no creo que el, que el house, lo que se entiende por house, lo que Ino entiende por house, o lo que el concepto de house del house café, ¿no? ese tipo de house nunca ha sido mainstream. Y ni siquiera ha tenido alguna figura destacada, así como el techno minimal tampoco nunca ha sido mainstream, pero tiene a alguien pues como... 
como Richie Houghton, ¿no? por ejemplo, que es una figura mundial que encabeza grandes festivales con el, con el Deep House, ha, ha tenido figuras importantes y figuras influyentes, pero nadie con ese nivel de ese poder mediático y ese poder de vender entradas. Yo eso lo, posiblemente es porque el, el, lo, que, lo que se puede entender como house comercial es pues un house completamente desnaturalizado, ¿no? por decirlo de alguna manera. El, el, el house que oyes en las emisoras de radio, de radio fórmula, que en realidad lo que es es música muy comercial, eh, que recuerda ligeramente al house en su base rítmica y que prácticamente es lo único que, que hereda y que ya no, ya no tiene nada que ver con, pues, con las raíces del house, con el soul y con el funky negro americano. conocí la música house pues a través de, de una discoteca que había en Gijón que se llamaba El Rocamar y mi padre pues bueno trabajaba allí y me traía cintas de, de las sesiones de esa discoteca uh, aquí en Gijón hubo un tiempo que, que se programaba muy fuerte las pistas de house y, y podías cocinar sobre todo en el club de la real vi cosas muy muy buenas cuando traían artistas americanos o sea, yo era un poco rarito de mis amigos mis amigos pues claro salían por ahí vamos a bueno a dónde <risa> a lo común, ¿sabes? Y yo pues, yo ahí me aburría porque me fijaba muchísimo en la música y entonces necesitaba pues ir a escuchar House, siempre fue House. Sí, entonces, pues. Es una música que es positiva y es alegre y, y incita a bailar, con lo cual no tiene ningún componente que, que no sea el común de una fiesta. Una fiesta es eso, una fiesta es alegría, una fiesta es bailar y una fiesta es energía. Muy buena, muy buena energía. Siempre tuve fijación por los grupos de música electrónica ya de la época de Kraftwerk, de la época de, de Pech Mode, todo aquello me, me llenó. Me gustaba y realmente me atrapó. Me atraparon los bombos, me atraparon los graves, eh, las cajas, eh, el baile, no sé, fue algo innato. Salió así de la nada, apareció y trax, y me, y me atrapó. Yo creo que vamos, estamos, estamos en un cambio y ese cambio nos está llevando un poco a eso, a abrir otra vez locales pequeños, juntarnos 100 personas, 80, 200, un festival pequeño donde estén mil personas pero que estén cómodas, ¿no? ¿No? que estén como, como sanguijuelas ahí, que les estén robando dinero, 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 que no tengan donde mear, que no tengan, no sé, hacer las cosas con un poquito más de calidad. Menos es más a veces, ¿no? Ricardo, que está empezando otra vez a al hacer toda esta historia, volver otra vez a, lo, a los tiempos antiguos, ¿no? como se dice. Y sobre todo estoy viendo que a nivel musical, vale, igual que en todos los estilos, al final te estás dando cuenta de que creció tan rápido que desde un, hubo un punto de inflexión en lo que se estaba haciendo, había que saber seleccionar muy bien lo que era bueno y lo que era malo. Había, para mí, demasiada música. Estamos volviendo otra vez y la música que se está empezando a producir, la música house que se está, que está, que se está produciendo ahora, vuelve otra vez a los inicios, vuelve otra vez al, al, a las cajas, vuelve otra vez a los timbales, vuelve otra vez a lo que era el house de verdad, donde nació y si nació ahí era porque funcionaba y porque gustaba. Volvemos otra vez al inicio. Es como hacer un pequeño reset y volver otra vez a donde nació, otra vez a la cultura de house, a los sub pequeños de lo que estamos hablando. Yo tenía 14 años y bueno, pues por diversas circunstancias tuve la suerte de poder colarme en un club de Vigo que se llamaba Opart y la verdad es que me quedé fascinado con la música que, eh, que pinchaban allí, ¿no? Y, y bueno, pues eh, me convertí un poco en asiduo de, de, de ese club y alucinábamos con la, con la música que ponían, ¿no? Con todo el house de Chicago, muy yaqui, muy crudo, con todo el acid y... Y creo que eso fue el momento en el que me enganché al house eh, de por vida. Y eso es algo que no ha cambiado en estos 20 años de, en los que llevo pinchando y unos cuantos más pues, en los que llevo disfrutando de este estilo, eh, pues asistiendo a fiestas, escribiendo sobre él y demás. ¿no? Eh, quizás el otro segundo gran momento en el que el house cambió, cambió mi vida pues fue ya en el año en 94, 95. Recuerdo pues, desde la época de los Max Mix, eh, aquellos kits con los que te podías hacer tu, 
tu propio mega mix y demás, el italo disco, el, el, no sé, el techno pop que sonaba por aquel entonces en, en muchos y muy buenos programas de, de la tele, cosa ahora impensable. Y recuerdo que, que bueno, pues conocimos eh, lo que estaba ocurriendo en Portugal, eh, conocimos que se estaban haciendo unas fiestas, sobre todo con artistas americanos, que solo conocíamos pues, por las revistas inglesas, Music Magazine, DJ Mag, etc. y que de alguna manera soñábamos con ver, pero que, pero que era realmente imposible en Galicia y en España, en cualquier sitio. Y, eh, y vimos que en Portugal se estaban haciendo cosas, ya conocíamos clubs de, de Lisboa como, como el Alcántara Mar, o en Swing, en, en Oporto, Industria, etc. Pero, pero fue cuando empezamos digamos, a peregrinar de una manera bastante asidua a Portugal, a Oporto y a Lisboa. Conocimos a la gente de, de Chaos Records, el tristemente fallecido Antonio Cuña, DJ Vive y, bueno, y la gente del Rocks también. Y, y bueno, y alucinamos con lo que estaba ocurriendo allí. No era normal, no era comparable a lo que nosotros conocíamos en, en Galicia y en otras ciudades de, de España. Creo que no era comparable ni siquiera a, a lo que ocurría en clubs de Madrid o de, o de Barcelona. ¿no? Clubs eh, con bonitos, bien equipados, con un sonido increíble, con una cabina realmente profesional, orientada a hacer fácil el trabajo del DJ y no al revés, que es lo que nos encontrábamos siempre en en España, ¿no? o sea, en ese sentido era como el día y la noche. Y, y comenzamos a bajar estas fiestas, yo en aquel momento estaba, colaboraba con varios, eh, varias revistas musicales de, de electrónica de las, que, de las que había en aquel momento, desde Disco 2000 de Barcelona, Undersounds de Madrid, eh, Dance Deluxe, etc. Y, eh, y recuerdo pues, muchas veces hablar con la gente de la redacción de la revista y decirles, oye, pues nada, esta noche nos vamos a nos vamos a, a Portugal porque es que hay una fiesta de, de Tribal Records donde va a pinchar, pues entre otros, Dani Terang y demás, que no había pinchado ni en Madrid, ni en Barcelona, ni en ningún festival en España. ¿no? Y la verdad es que no se lo creía porque tenían una imagen un poco distorsionada de lo que, de lo que era Portugal, ¿no? viéndolo un poco desde, desde lejos. tanto, aunque parece que haya pasado un siglo, pero hace nada aquí teníamos eh, los Festival Sonar, los Nube 81, eh, los Fresh Weekend, los primeros años, Terraza del Nube y también clubs, también clubs empezando a formar un poco la cultura electrónica también en esta ciudad pequeña, pero especial, y ya, clubs como el Cine, Telefunken, Superclub, que estaban ahí rindiendo a, a muy alto nivel, trayendo artistas casi gratuitamente a ver aquí en tu ciudad, entonces pues con esta, con esta buena salud que tenía la electrónica en aquellos años era difícil no contagiarse por esta bacteria y chavales como yo que podíamos actuar las pistas que podíamos y de las que no podíamos también empezábamos a preguntarnos pues, de qué va esto en esto de la, de la electrónica y sobre todo esta gente es muy responsable de convertirnos a gente como nosotros en unos adictos más a, a la música house. La primera vez que escuché hablar sobre House Café eh, fue allí alrededor del 2004-2005 que por aquel entonces yo trabajaba en, en Decoder Music eh, y era el label manager, me encargaba de toda la fabricación de todos los sellos de, de Decoder y entre ellos encontraba eh, House Café y y bueno, en un principio estaba, era un poco confuso porque eh, pensaba que tenía algo que ver con Café del Mar, pero, pero no tenía nada que ver y menos aún cuando me dijeron que estaba eh, en Galicia. Aluciné porque eh, Norte de España, que siempre ha, sido, ha tenido como una especie de fama de muy tecno, muy duro, sobre todo por la zona de Gijón y tal, 
y, y claro, estos chicos seguían manteniendo el, el rollo del house, del deep house, del spiritual house, eh, más aún cuando el house en esa época estaba tocado ya de muerte porque el minimal y el minimal techno lo estaba arrasando completamente todo. Y al tiempo entonces es cuando me invitaron a ir a pinchar a House Café y ahí es cuando realmente eh, vi todo lo que había estado escuchando por otros DJs y todo lo que me habían estado contando y es que realmente aquello estaba completamente lleno y había una sensación en el público de que realmente les gustaba el House. Y había ese hilo de esperanza de que no estaba todo arrasado por el, por el minimal en esa época. My first gig at House Café, and uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. The atmosphere in that club, the, the music, the music the resident DJs played, was so deep and so much house and so so different to to many other things that I that I seen and, and uh, felt so far in Spain or on Spanish house clubs. That that was the definition of house music and and. Um, It just blew me away. Some of the best experiences of my DJ career I had at House Cafe in Spain. It's amazing that people don't even show up to the club until like four o'clock in the morning. And you know, in, in California, where I'm from, the clubs start around 10 and they go till two, maybe three, four if you're lucky, and then they're done. Everyone goes home. Uh, you know, in Spain, everyone goes out later, and in this town, in this club, House Cafe, things don't even get started until four o'clock. And I just have this amazing memory of a of, of totally empty, cold, chilly, freezing night, um, and showing up at the venue, and nobody was there. But gradually, little by little, the place filled up, and by 4.30, 5 o'clock, it was just rammed. And so, I mean, I was taking my clothes off. It was so hot and sweaty in there. Um, I would, you know, and I played records till 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock, and just, it was amazing. Hands down, one of the most intimate, most underground parties that I played for in all my years of uh, traveling and being a DJ. Um, just amazing vibe, you know, kind of one of those parties that go till 9, 10 in the morning and it only gets better as you go. Mystery of life. a while back obviously uh, when it first started more or less and I remember just being like this place on the other side of the country that everyone kept talking about uh, that actually played deep underground house stuff and at the time house had been popping I mean, it was going on all of your French house was quite big Chicago house and all that stuff was still kicking it here and um, and I was really intrigued by this place because not a lot of places were playing quality underground house stuff Uh, when I walked in the club, you could really, uh, you could really sense that like, these people actually cared about what they were building there, and uh, and it was just vibing. 
As soon as you walk through the door, you can feel it. It wasn't a massive place or anything, but people were really into it. And, uh, and they were into the house, you know? And they knew it was up. Bueno, encima cuando, cuando fui a pinchar allí vi lo que había, ¿no? lo que era el host café, lo que eran ellos, el nivel de producción que tenían, el, el nivel de las fiestas, que bueno, pues, pues vamos, el host café en aquella época tenía, tenía un ambiente como podía tener el, el MOOC de Barcelona, que era el club donde yo pinchaba, o, o, o los clubs internacionales donde pinchaba yo aquí en la época, en, en, pues no sé, en Berlín o Moscú. Y era bastante particular que eso fuera en, en una ciudad pequeña de la costa gallega, quiero decir, no es, no es precisamente el mejor caldo de cultivo para, para hacer un colectivo de house internacional con, con conexiones con Nueva York. ¿no? I met Eno um, in 1998, I believe, for 17 years now. And uh, around that time, in 98, I was about to quit doing uh, my MC. And I said to my manager, "Look, I want to, I want to stop working with uh, with dance music, with house music. I'm going to focus on." Uh, on production and making my album, my hip hop album, and help other artists to rise and, and build up the movement right here. After one week that we had this conversation, um, she called me and said, look, I've got a gig for you outside Portugal, so you must say yes, because he said if it was outside, you will accept it. And so I did without even making too many questions about it. I just asked where, and uh, she answered me, it's, well, that's in Spain, in Galicia, La Coruña. I met Eno, and since that day, my life changed drastically, because I was supposed to quit, and he didn't let me to quit. We had a great time together playing. He played this wonderful deep house, we, since then, we had more than 30 gigs together since that time. The best gig we had together, I wouldn't say the best, but um, the most emblematic gig that will stay in our memories forever, it's that Monegro's festival. Uh, and it's a, a beautiful story until we reach that stage on that particular area at the desert where we performed. There's a, um, a nice story until we get there. Uh, I just got the plane from, from Lisbon. I was living in Lisbon at that time. I just got the plane into a Coruña. He you know, went to pick me up and he said right away, look, um, we should rehearsal. It's a big festival, so we should prepare ourselves to 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 a big performance. It's a it's a very important gig, something that we never did before. We always felt so comfortable with each other and uh, trust each other, and we knew each other, both what we could do or not do, and but he decided to to practice a bit before the festival, you know, listening to some some records and see if I was feeling comfortable over with, with my voice. And so we did. I just unpacked my rack that we had a, an effect processor, uh, a compressor, and um, I had anything, ah, and a mixer, and completely analog stuff. So I unpacked my things and, um, and plugged it in to his mixer and we started to, to have uh, our afternoon session just right after coming out the plane we drive home to his studio plug everything in and you know 
start housing and we just got the plane and went to Barcelona and uh, when we when we came out from the hotel a transfer came to get us and and the driver said uh, we have to to pass through the airport to get Mr. Tanaglia case and we don't have enough room we said we don't mind Just let's go let's go get Mr. Tanaglia stuff and Eno turns 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 his head to me and said look we're not going to to bother him and uh, the the car was closed and Mr. Tanagli was having that chill suddenly right like 10 seconds um, Mr. Tanagli just woke his eyes like, pointed fingers for each other and he was with the eyes closed he couldn't see us and he pointed right away just eyes completely open and then started laugh <laughs> and that was a really strong situation and uh, really strong for us we felt really good about it and went to the hotel guess who was at the hotel plastic man was there rich Orton. and you know gave him his promo this uh, this is the the album um, this album came out when we went to Monegros, really fresh on vinyl. And uh, Plastic Man was very kind, or Rich Orton, if you prefer, he was really kind. He accepted the vinyl and thank and thank Eno for for this vinyl. Around six o'clock, Plastic Man started to play, and the sun was still up, and he put it. The record just like this to protect his laptop from the sun so everybody was watching uh, hundreds and hundreds of people were watching this record just like this you know's record and then that was the second situation from the festival and what happens next is that before we play um, right half an hour before we play there was a, a big storm lots of wind lots of you know sand in the air like tornadoes um, rain and people started imagine in the middle of the desert completely you know um, like 45 degrees and suddenly a big storm coming and even windy some fresh wind and people started to run a tent where we were playing was called white label uh, started to get real packed, you know, and uh, when we started to play, the place was so packed, so packed, nobody could get in anymore. It was you know, it's like sold out. <laughs> I don't remember, I don't know if it, the, the first record that he played was Acid Salsa. Acid Salsa, you see, it's a track, it's the first track from uh, 981 North from this album that I've shown before. Acid Salsa. When he played this, people just got crazy. And when he played this one, Take Control, I was live on stage performing to Take Control live. That was amazing, and at that time was a beautiful thing was that strictly vinyl, no MP3, no CD, just vinyl. That was amazing. My name's Carl Craig. I'm here in Detroit, straight from the Beast Labs, being beastie for my boy Eno at La Coruña, my man, and seen you in a long time. We're gonna come back and rock the nation. So anyway, um, House Nation, when I first came, you know, I was playing as Inner Zone Orchestra. I did, did myself as DJ. Uh, we'd do these big um, halls that were, were incredible. And the people that were coming out for, for a town that I really 
never heard of, you know, people were coming out for these parties. It was like the only spot to come to, um, you know, parties that, that were, were on the level of anything anywhere else in the world, you know, but it was just amazing. The architecture, um, the hospitality, the music, everything's cool. I, I would, I'm thinking about times when, you know, it would take me back to this place where he had a studio and stuff and I could check out a studio and it's in the spot and see how people live there. And, and it was really impressive, impressive times, fantastic times to be there. And, um, you know, as always, it was always the, the utmost in professional uh, uh, courtesy and, and making sure that I felt great while I was there. The food, excellent. The music, always excellent. And you know, it was one that would definitely take a risk. He he would take a risk to put things on. He'd take a risk to see that some great stuff would happen for for his his uh, house cafe parties, and that people were left not only satisfied with, with getting something that they expected, but really maybe even experience something that they never experienced before. And that's something that, that you have to do when you're in a small place. Coming from Detroit, I know this for certain because if you just play into what people want, then you know, you lose it right there. You lose it. You have them for a bit and then people will just be like ready to move on and you're not able to move on because you don't even have that that mentality to move on. Like, this is Carl Craig, Detroit Beast Labs, Planet E Communications, 2015, out. crónicas que escribí de, de alguna de sus sesiones para, para la revista House Café Magazine, pues eh, se me ocurrió pues eh, de alguna manera como bautizarlo como The Deep Man, porque en aquel momento él era eh, de los pocos eh, o prácticamente casi el único DJ en Galicia que pinchaba sonidos eh, más deep, más, más house y no tan duros como a lo mejor pinchábamos otros y, y bueno, creo que él lo adoptó eh, y lo estuvo utilizando como un AK durante bastante tiempo y bueno, pues ese fue un poco el, el origen de, de, um, del nombre. I think we gave each other a lot. Um, culturally, musically, especially culturally, um, I think we changed a lot um, in Coruña and uh, I'm very proud to be a part of that. And, and yeah. Además, no te olvides que yo fui el padrino del nombre del bar House Café. <laughs> La idea, pero bueno, se quedó muy bien, creo yo. Um, I mean... We always, uh, when, we, when we met you guys, I mean, that was the whole thing with our, our collective was, was to bring sort of like-minded people together, you know, and you, you do your own thing under that umbrella, you know. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm proud to think uh, House Café and, uh, and you guys are part of that, you know. So, yeah, I hope that one day he will come on the island, so in the north of France, south of Belgium, il manque, euh, il manque un DJ comme ça pour euh, retourner un peu le, la tête des gens. Euh, on n'attend que ça, quoi. So keep on doing what you do. 
Thank you for being part of this movie and this movie and I hope I see you soon. I say mucha gracias to you and um, bye bye. Then it was amazing to see how you know he's developing himself as music producer, becoming respected uh, house music producer, not only in, in local scene. Uh, foi uma das vezes que fui tocar uh, ao ao aos café ao telefone que não recordo na Corunha um, de ter comido a melhor ou uma das melhores palhas uh, feita, uh, que foi feita por ele. É um pincha tornas que tem uma conexão com a gente, tem uma seleção de temas que na verdade é de muito respeito. Eu tenho muito amor e respeito para o Ian Seth, especialmente. He was doing a grand job with Republic Music, um, both in NYC. Um. Sin lugar a dudas, uno de los embajadores que tiene España para The Deep House, que no es un estilo de música especialmente favorecido aquí en España. You know, he's a guy. He's a visionary, a visionary for Spain, and uh... he, he's been doing this for 20 years and it shows, you know, that, he, that kind of ability to pick music and create a scene and, and sustain it for years, I mean, that is something that a lot of people have tried and failed miserably and Eno you know, continues to do it. Uh, yeah, pick up to House Cafe, 20 years, that's it. Nada, que otros 20 seguro que caen y, y nada, espero estar yo ahí a tu lado también, tío. Pues mi tío Hino, que es DJ y me encanta su música. Y a mí 